Hello, my lovely library lions. Today, we're going to be doing my April wrap up. Uh, I actually got a lot of reading done this month, despite the fact that Shadow and Bone was coming out on Netflix, and that was all I could think about. So let's get right into it. The first book I finished this month was obviously Rule of Wolves by Lee Bardugo. I got the Waterstones signed edition thanks to my best friend because they wouldn't ship to Canada during the pandemic. This is sort of an ending for the Grishaverse and sort of not. Um, Lee Bardugo has not confirmed if she's writing Six of Crows 3, but she definitely sets up Six of Crows 3 in this book. Um, I will be a little disappointed if they never follow up on that plot, but overall I love this book. I teared up at points in it. You get to see all your favorite characters. There's a cameo for absolutely everyone. No one is left out of this beautiful sort of closing of Nikolai's story. Um, I thought the romance was really good. I really liked how the story progressed. And I liked the Darkling's conclusion as well. I think he's going to be a little hard done by if we don't get the third Six of Crows book. I think that'll be really important to the conclusion. But otherwise, I love this book. Five out of five stars. I don't have too much to say about it. It's really hard to talk about it without spoiling major plot points. And I know some people won't have had a chance to get to it yet, but it's just so good. It's so good. The next book I read was my Owl Crate book, and it was These Violent Delights by Chloe Gong. So this was the December Owl Crate book, I believe. It's a Romeo and Juliet retelling set in 1920s fantasy Shanghai. And there was a lot I thought I could like about this premise, but it didn't really deliver on some things. I don't know why it was a Romeo and Juliet retelling. There was really no reason for it to be a Romeo and Juliet retelling. It doesn't hit a lot of the major plot beats. The characters aren't very similar to Romeo and Juliet. The other than the names and the fact that they're star-crossed lovers, we don't see a lot of the Romeo and Juliet plot in this book, especially because the characters were already in love prior to the book starting. So they already had their relationship and then they broke up because of a big betrayal and now they're coming back together. It's mostly about the two gangs fighting against a sickness that's plaguing the country and I thought that was a really strong story on its own. I thought it could be really good if it had focused on being that story instead of trying to retell Romeo and Juliet. Because there's really nothing in this story that that needs to be Romeo and Juliet centric. There's nothing in this story that needs to be a retelling. And I don't think it gains anything from being a retelling. I think that actually hinders it as a story. And I ended up not enjoying it as much because it was so focused on trying to shove in certain scenes while like twisting them so that they weren't really true to the heart of Romeo and Juliet anymore. But they had to have a scene that had this plot device because Romeo and Juliet had it. So overall, not a huge fan. I'm really disappointed because the world was so vibrant and well designed. I loved the Shanghai that we got to see in this world. I thought it was really great and I liked the historical aspect of it too. But ugh, the story and the characters just ended up, ended up falling really, really flat for me. Because Shadow and Bone was coming out this month, me and my best friend reread Six of Crows and Crooked Kingdom, the best books in the Grishaverse, in my opinion. Um, not a lot to say about these. I loved them even more when I reread them. I felt like things that I had missed on the first read through because I did initially read them before I read Shadow and Bone. So I felt like if I missed anything on the first read through, I got it this time. I love these characters. I love the plot. It's such a fun and easy read for me. I know it won't be for everyone. And I think the hype around these books is so insane at this point that they cannot possibly live up to it. But I adored it. I adored every second of reading these books. I would reread them again, and I probably will. I just really want a third book. I really want a third book to conclude these character stories because some of them are left in places where they definitely have more room to grow and become the characters that they need to be by the, the end of the story, I feel like anyways. If we don't have a Kinej kiss, I'm gonna be so sad. Continuing with my read along with Bookish Realms and Beautifully Bookish Bethany, I read the Woman Who Rides Like a Man by Tamora Pierce. This is my least favorite book in the Atlanta series so far. I thought that, you know, I thought when I initially read it, I thought it's going to be so great when Atlanta is an adult. That's the part of the story I'm looking forward to. I want Atlanta to be an adult because it's going to be so much more interesting to read about an, an adult knight versus, you know, all the years as her page growing up and hiding her, her gender. But what we got was sort of a white savior story where Alana goes to a desert 
land, which is sort of like the Middle East. It has Middle Eastern cultural influences. And she goes there and she teaches them how to be civilized, how to treat women properly because they don't know how to treat their women. She shows them women can be anything and you shouldn't believe in this shaman that you've believed in your whole life. You should follow my ways instead. And she trains women shaman and, and brings them into culture. And the other thing I really didn't like was I was never a Jonathan fan. I was always more of a fan of George. But Jonathan in this book is so out of character. He doesn't respect Alana at all anymore as a person. He doesn't respect her as a woman or as a friend or as anything. He's whiny. He's pushy. And it seems like he doesn't care what Alana wants at all. And I thought that their relationship in this book particularly was really toxic. And now I, I can't eat. Before I could see her ending up with George or John, I thought either is fine. I prefer George, but they're both good for her. This book ruins John. John is not a good person at all anymore. He's sort of just gross. I really hope I'll like Linus Rampant more because the first two books were actually pretty enjoyable, even if they were fast paced and sort of middle grade. This still reads middle grade despite sort of the sex and the adult characters, but I really didn't like it just because the plot was not great and the characters all felt bastardized. I read an anthology this month and it was Dear Bully, which is written by 70 authors. Um, it's only 300 and some pages and it's by 70 authors, so many of the stories are quite short and I don't think that was to its benefit. Uh, I didn't feel like I could connect to any of the stories very well because they were only one or two pages and then they were over. Some of the stories had themes I didn't really like, like people going back and looking at their bullies and being like, haha, they have a shitty life now, so that's what they get for being a bully. Is that such a, a weird narrative? Because some bullies are going to be successful, and so if you're only waiting for your bully to have a bad life, sometimes you're not going to get that. Some bullies are going to go on to be very successful and happy people, despite how terrible they were to you. So that's not a good narrative to have. And I also felt like a lot of the book was just not very good stories. Um, it could have done with so much curation and, and picking better stories. I loved when they included comics and poems. I felt like if they would have included more multimedia stories that would have been stronger. So it's divided into sort of these sections with, with headers. So we have Dear Bully, Just Kidding, Survival, Regret, Thank You Friends, Insight, Speak, Write It. And these are all essentially meaningless. Some of the stories, like, there's no reason why they're in a particular subheader. They could be anywhere. Dear Bully isn't even all letters to bullies. Some of them are just normal stories. I don't know why it was divided this way, because it doesn't make any sense. I would have preferred it if they divided it between, you know, these are the stories from the bullies, these are the stories from the victims, or here are comics about it, here are stories from, like, high school bullying versus elementary school bullying. Divide it in a way that makes sense and that has meaning, or don't divide it at all. I just felt like th there are stories in here that are really poignant. There are stories that are really sort of touching, that make you understand what it would be like to be scared to go to school every day, why it's such a bad thing, and obviously bullying is bad. The, 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 the concept behind this book is good. We should stop bullying. But it's not well curated. And part of that, I think, is that it has 70 stories, and you can't have 70 good two-page long stories. It's just not... It, it's very unlikely. If this was curated better, it could have been such a strong overall book. And I just feel like that's where it failed. It just, as a book, it doesn't have cohesion and it doesn't feel powerful. There are certainly stories in here that feel powerful, but together as a collection, I don't feel like it works. The manga I read this month was My Hero Academia, volume 27. I'm a big fan, not a big fan of this volume. This is where I know a lot of my friends started to drop the series, especially reading chapters on release, because this arc, the war arc, is so long, and the battles are messy, it's hard to tell what's going on, they flip between two different places a lot, and it just feels like this is a downturn for the series. We do get a bit of a second wind when we have the Dobby reveal, because everyone has been waiting for that for centuries, so that is good, but this is sort of right before that, it just focuses on Hawks, and some of the Class 1A students get the spotlight, which is really good. I love seeing the Class 1A students get the spotlight. But we also have a whole chapter that focuses on Mirko, who is a really fun character. She's well-designed. But also, we have so many characters in My Hero Academia 
who have not had page time or screen time in volumes, who people love already, who have stories that require development, and it feels like a waste to just keep introducing new pros who don't really matter to the overall story and being like, here's a whole chapter focused on this character for no reason, instead of focusing on any of the wealth of characters that already exist to be focused on. I love that they gave Kaminari and Jiru two panels and, and developed that, but I felt like the Mirko chapter was just a waste. I like her as a character, I think she's well designed, but we, we don't have time to cover every character that exists in this world. We, we have a main cast and they need to be focused on because they are so big at this point that focusing on anything else just feels like a detour and I didn't get any value out of the Mirko chapter. I don't like reading the fights because they are messy and it's hard to tell what's going on. So it was just, it just felt like a waste of page time. I'm excited for the next book because I want to see, you know, I, I, I do love this series. I do still love it. I'm hanging on by a thread, even though a lot of people have given up. And I know that the Dobby reveal is coming and I know that this arc is ending. But this was really, this was hard to get through. The final book I read this month has been on my TBR for quite a while, and it's Little Fires Everywhere by Celeste New. I love this. It was such a good sort of broad story. I don't read literary fiction a lot, and this made me think that maybe I would like literary fiction. It's essentially a story that takes place in a very privileged sort of upper class town called, well, subdivision, called Shaker Heights, and it's about a lot of things. Mostly it's about the relationship between mothers and their daughters. It's about familial love. It's about, you know, the conformity and nonconformists and how nonconformists handle the suburbs. And mostly it's about how this family adopts this Chinese baby and her mother wants her back and how that divides the town. I really liked all the characters. I felt like it was so well written. Each character feels sympathetic. You wouldn't think you would sympathize with some of them, but because you get so many POVs, you can understand why they behave the way they behave. Even if you know what they're doing is negative and bad, you can see why they're doing those things and it makes your heart hurt for them. I didn't have a strong a strong pull to either side of the who should have the little girl, Mei Ling or Mirabelle, because the McCullogs wanted her so badly and they had loved her for a year and they were good parents but they didn't understand how to raise a Chinese child. That much is true. They, they weren't going to raise her with any respect for her race. They weren't going to be able to teach her her culture. Her mother, her birth mother obviously loves her. She adores her. She's going to be able to teach her about Chinese culture, teach her the language and help her to love herself. But she also has a bad track re record as a mother. Regardless of why that is, she's proven that she couldn't care for her child at one point in time. And your heart just sort of breaks for all these characters because none of them are are bad people deep down. They all just want what they think is the best possible version of society. Of They all want what's best for Mirabella Mailing. They all want what's best for Shaker Heights or for their daughters or for their families. None of them are going out with sort of a, a negative, a will to make a negative impact. So I thought that was really beautiful. The photography was really well described. Mia's work is beautiful. It really made me think about photography as a transformative art form versus just being sort of capturing whatever is out there. She so carefully curates her photos and we can get descriptions of them. They sound so beautiful. I really want to see them. And I just overall adored this book. I thought everything about it was good. It was such a fun read. It was easy to sit down and read in a couple of sittings because there's always something happening. And there are some just absolutely heartbreaking scenes like in the courtroom where the lawyer is talking about how there are no Asian dolls. And in the 90s, that's true. There were no Asian representations for dolls. Barbie didn't have an Asian Barbie. And you know, as someone raising a, an Asian daughter, it would be hard for you to find a doll that looks like her. And when you raise kids with dolls that don't look like them, they have standards for beauty that they won't be able to meet. And that really broke my heart. So I'm glad things are a little better now, even if they're not perfect. But this is a really good read, and I think I'll read maybe more from this author, if not just more literary fiction in general. So that is it for my April wrap-up. Obviously, the rest of my time was spent thinking about Shadow and Bone, watching Shadow and Bone over and over, and wondering who they're going to cast as Nick Lyon season two. I read a total of eight books this month, so that's a little better than I usually do. I'm still not quite 
hitting the 10 that I hit in January, but I'm going to keep trying. And I hope that you all have a lovely weekend and that I see you again soon.